Hey, does any of you have a uh, USB-C charger I could borrow? It might work. I don't know. It, it's not taking the one of like this I have. Let's see. I just, I left my freaking lot charger at home and No, it's not taking it. Anyone else? No, I'll just go talk to tech later. Will it work like when you plug it into the actual wall? I actually have one. Well, no, it won't. I know it won't. Cause I just bought like the same exact thing for Target like half an hour ago. So, oh well, well. Um, stress is here. No. Okay, anyway, so all right, I have to let my brain do one thing at a time. Okay. Hey, everybody. It's been a bit. As, uh, but, but I could talk. You could hear my voice working. It's amazing. <coughs> sort of. <coughs> Are there any questions? Are there any issues going on right now in the class? No, our paper would do Sunday, right? We turned it in. Um, this is our last lecture. Uh, I'm gonna be skimming through it so that we can actually um, talk about uh, the, the topics that are on there that are on the study guide. We are going to be um, stopping at noon to talk about the terms on the study guide. Uh, our exam itself is going to be on, <coughs> and please write this down because this might be the only chance I have to look at my laptop because the battery is actively dying. On, uh, you are noon to 1.45 in this room on Monday, December 12th. That is when we're doing it. Somebody took note of that, right? Okay, thank you. Good, because my computer's shutting down in a moment, I'm sure. Do you need like a laptop charger? Yeah, or, do you have that? Yeah, I do. Thank you I so much. I thought you meant like a phone charger. No. Like a <sighs> Lifesaver, good job. Thank you. Did I borrow this from you earlier on the semester? I remember doing it. It's this. possible. Who knows? Who knows? Teamwork makes the dream work. Okay. So in this lecture, we are talking about um, basically wrapping up. This is the last paragraph you would have on your paper. This is uh, the, you know, fun little speech at the end of the movie. This is just kind of that sort of stuff. Um, there's a couple terms in here I want you to make sure to get. Uh, I want to thank you, Leslie, for inviting me uh, last time and uh, at the uh, USG event and then uh, not screaming at me <laughs> when I tried to pick a fight with the audience. But, but I, I basically told them they're all wrong about their recycling and then people don't like to be told about that. And then, then I said, uh, and, and your paper products, you can throw them in the garbage. And they said, no, you can't. I was like, but Leslie, tell them. And she said, don't bring me into this. <laughs> and it was, it was pretty great. 
Um, so uh, let's let's do this now that my brain's actually started. Uh, okay, so over this course, we have discussed. Uh, I don't know if we actually got to it directly, but there are these two terms here, uh, anthrocentric environmentalism versus ecocentric environmentalism. And that this is socially constructed. We are humans. We, and probably um, other life forms do this as well. We can't interview them, but we see the world from our perspective with it being a human world, right? The reality of the matter is that is a social construction and the reality of the world as it actually is, is that it may be more beneficial and more correct to look at it from an ecocentric environmentalism standpoint, being from the environment's perspective, not from the human perspective. And that might be what we've been getting wrong the entire time. Turn right on, I'll make sure I'm sharing. See, I wasn't. See, isn't it lovely? One of these days, this is the last class. This is my last chance to get it right. So, and the point of this final lecture and the course as a whole is that a wise environmentalist is both. Absolutely, the, rea the true reality of it, if there is a such thing as true reality, is that it is ecocentric, but to make humans act, we have to play off of that climate um, paranoia, that climate anxiety, and talk from an anthrocentric perspective once in a while just to get Uncle Bob to come along. And we have come a tremendous way. It is easy to think, oh, we have never done anything. Uh, the reality of the matter is, if we would have kept going the way we were in the mid-20th century, uh, this world would be unlivable at this point. We, we have taken actions. Um, we, we have. Uh, but certainly, there's a long way to go. Before the 1960s, people just ignored pollution. Just absolutely, it's there. It exists but we ignore it. They weren't dumb, they saw it. Did you know that the Cuyahoga River lit on fire in the 1960s? Yeah, it lit on fire, but it wasn't, that wasn't an isolated incident. River fires were just a thing that happened in industrial areas. Um, and I think the Cuyahoga River thing uh, is more famous because of uh, the, the beer dedicated to that event. I can't remember which beer it is. Um, Lake Erie, do you know that Lake Erie was known to be an absolute cesspool of horror in the 70s? Like it was, it's still not beautiful, despite what my wife would like. It's an okay river, it's a fine river. A lake, it's not a river. But it is so much better than it used to be. Lake Erie, it used to be you go in that lake and come out and you would have a rash. It was that, but it was horrible. We have come a long way to recreating it into an ecosystem. And all of that river and water stuff was only made possible by the 1972 Clean Water Act, which was controversial. It was vetoed by Nixon. And then that veto was overruled by Congress. 1970, we had our first Earth Day. The boomers did a couple of things. In all fairness to that, 1972, we have the passage of the Clean Water Act, and then 1976, the Keep America Beautiful campaign uh, started a large-scale public education campaign. This is really the shift where we start to see uh, not ignoring uh, pollution anymore, really, but we see at this um, shifting point, this is when the boomers were coming out of college, right? And they were seeing that the world that their parents had created was very, very polluted. So then they started to try to move into this way. 1983, the first Canadian quote, unquote, blue box curbside recycling project was implemented. 
So it, was, it wasn't until 1983 where we had curbside recycling. And there was an amazing lag. We didn't have curbside recycling in Columbus until the early 2010s. Uh, and many areas still don't have curbside recycling. Uh, from conversations I've had with people in this regard, uh, it's my understanding. I would not be surprised. I, I, I'm guessing that those areas that don't have curbside recycling yet, uh, based on the sorting that we saw at the uh, recycling plant, I'm guessing they're just going to start just recycling all the garbage, right? And just sorting it in the plant. That's probably what my guess will be. I, I don't really know, but that's what they're doing at my parents' town right now. Do you have something? Yeah, yeah. yeah in my parents, uh, where my parents live, they say that they're actually, um, they just recycle everything and they sort the garbage out of it. And honestly, knowing what we've seen, I, I kind of believe that now. And that's probably where it's going to be. In 85, Carl Sagan warns Congress of the potential for the greenhouse effect on Earth. Um, are you familiar with Sagan? Some? A little bit or not? Who doesn't have, has never heard of Carl Sagan? Anyone? Okay, good. Um, yeah, Sagan was the guy. Sagan, um, I don't really know how much attention we would have paid at all to climate change in the first place in the 20th century, if it weren't for Sagan. He did a massive push in this regard uh, as really that front and center uh, scientist, similar to Neil deGrasse Tyson, but not nearly as obnoxious. The ozone layer is a very, very good example of what we can do because it's okay now. We fixed an environmental problem. We fixed it. Um, the public became very concerned about this thing called the, the hole in the ozone layer in, it was about the late 1980s when we started and we spotted it through weather satellites. Basically the protective layer of the ozone on both of the poles, this is for the South Pole in particular, was getting thinner and thinner and thinner. And in that, um, radiation was coming down from space. And if you would be exposed to that, it, it gave a dramatically higher chance of you getting cancer is really what it came down to. So had we not fixed this, what would have happened is we would have, the sun would have been irradiating us while the carbon was suffocating us at the same time. So we did avoid part of the problem. Um, this was all caused by chlorofluor chlor chlorofluorocarbons, uh, which uh, are released. This is why you don't burn styrofoam. Uh, this is why we shouldn't have styrofoam, but also why you don't burn styrofoam. But it's more than just burning styrofoam. Uh, almost every spray bottle product of this era used CFCs, almost every single one. We adapted, we changed, we changed industries. And after we stopped using this stuff, I mean, it's still kind of used, but to a much lesser degree, it starts, oh, this, this stops there. It, it heal, it's healed back, right? So now I don't have it on this chart. It's back to the 1980 point. And that is about the natural state of the atmosphere where it should be in terms of uh, that ozone layer bit. And you guys probably haven't learned very much about that because it's not so much of a problem anymore. Uh, questions there? It was a big deal. They used to sell Big Macs in styrofoam containers. <laughs> like, that, like it, it's a big deal. In the early 2000s, we, I really sincerely, social scientifically, as a pseudo historian in this regard, don't know if the politicization of global warming in the early 2000s helped us or hurt us, right? Because half of the population became convinced it was a very real problem, but then the other half became convinced that it was made up by Democrats. Um, I don't know. A major down point during this era was when George W. Bush withdrew the United States 
from the Kyoto Protocol. Um, if the Kyoto Protocol was the uh, proto um, uh, COP19, and if we would have been able to stick with the Pre Kyoto Protocol and then the later uh, Paris Accords, we would have gained about 20 years of movement in this regard. But because of the political machinations of the early uh, 2000s, we just we froze for a while. Um, 2006 is when an inconvenient truth came out. And then another major low point was when uh, Vice President nominee Sarah Palin attempted to appeal to the American public by promising to drill on nature preserves off the coast of Alaska. And that was way too close uh, to being successful. And they, that some of that drilling did actually occur, but it would have been much to a much larger scale had uh, McCain become president instead of Obama. Uh, if you're not super familiar with uh, Palin politically, uh, she very much um, is similar to a Trump flavor, but a little bit, uh, Palin's an interesting political character. In the 2010s, we do start to see society, we have, we have made very significant cultural leeway in the last 15 years. We absolutely have. Um, climate change is one of the issues addressed by the Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, if you're not familiar with Occupy Wall Street, look it up yourself. It's, it's just adjacent. 2018, we see Extinction Rebellion come into place. Uh, this is a group that rejects conventional political strategy in favor of civil disobedience. Um, Extinction Rebellion is big in Europe. It's real big in Europe. I've seen little blips and blops of them here in the States, but it is the primary movement that uh, Greta Thunberg is involved with uh, in Europe. Are they present on OSU campus, you know, Extinction Rebellion? I don't know. Uh, they're, they're, they're real big in Europe. They're the ones that were throw, quote unquote throwing paint at the artworks uh, to make the point that you're destro we're destroying this, you're destroying our planet. Hey, if anyone, there was glass in front of it anyway. It was pure performance art. The art wasn't even destroyed um, for what it's worth, but it got the attention, so whatever. Um, yeah, 2018, uh, Greta starts Strike for Climate and those have led to up to 4 million protesters immediately prior to uh, COVID breaking out. Um, and there's more uh, breakdown of that online if you want to read it. So this is where we've been, now let's move to where we are. On the micro level, we know that we have to develop normal environmentalism. This is something that has to happen. But how do we actually get there? I look at, I wonder, like, what does it mean that we should only have recycling bins, period, and let those recycling bins get slightly soiled by people putting other things in them toward the end of just making recycling the easiest thing possible? I don't know. There's all kinds of questions. How do we get to the point where making the environmental choice is the default choice? And we, we've talked about this. As established earlier in the course, we already have many of the technologies needed to do the thing. Uh, we do have accessible public transit. We just have to fix it to make it more accessible. We know how trains work, for example. Uh, we, uh, being vegetarian, if you're vegetarian, it absolutely helps. Uh, that is a major carbon load that you can lift. Uh, people like me, I need a massive amount of protein to make my body operate though. Um, but if you could be at least partially vegetarian, that's great. Just don't make your diet all bagels like I did when I was in grad school. That's not good for you either. Uh, bikes are amazing modes of technology. Um, tiny houses are interesting alternatives. Um, or even just a smaller house. I have uh, a pretty small little house. Uh, I am not bragging about that. I just happen to have a small house. I but like heating is major, right? Heating is a, heating and electricity and lights. That's all a major thing. 
Uh, solar panels are present. Solar panels do exist. I have seen in my neighborhood more solar panels go up in the last five years than I've ever seen solar panels before. So it's happening. Um, energy efficient appliances, that's also a big deal. That Energy Star label on the appliances is not just a marketing gimmick. It actually does make a difference. And uh, of course, we need to conserve our resources when possible. Um, so it's a matter of social transition is my point here. We have what we need. We have what we need to establish normal environmentalism. It is not a matter of technology that we don't have. So the authors of our text argue that our current struggle to be environmentally friendly, even though it does not match what is easy on our society, is that transition. And we have to continue to do it in the hard way until it becomes normal. That's the hard work, right? We have to, and it doesn't seem like hard work, but it's many, many, many acts of little stuff. It's putting that dumb coffee cup in your pocket and carrying it around till you can recycle it, right? And these are these are the slow social transitions that we make as as an everyone. Um, and but eventually, when those acts are expected by everyone, because your kids see you doing it, right, or your students see you doing it, or whatever, then it will become eventually. And you know what? People do accidentally dump oil in their yard or something, right? The shit happens, right? Just stay on it. I guess it's like dieting kind of, right? Like, or whatever. It's, it, don't be too hard on yourself. Don't get too environmentally angsty. And it's that hardness on ourselves that... Uh, that really is a major psychological and social component of um, making normal environmentalism difficult. Uh, in the sociology of family, we call this the attitude behavior split, the AB split. So if people hold certain beliefs or attitudes, but they are unable or not fully willing to make that work, then it causes emotional distress. Um, in uh, Arlie Holschild, uh, in her book, uh, The Second Shift, observed that uh, there are many men in uh, heteronormative relationships that wind up doing less work than their uh, wives, right? And they don't like that. But if they can't figure out how to make that workload equal, many men will actually become less useful because it's a coping mechanism. They just kind of give up, right? That same kind of idea is absolutely present in environmentalist issues. Uh, my, I'll, I'll pretend my parents care. They kind of care. They care the best they can. But they don't have recycling programs where they live right? They simply don't. They don't have paper recycling. So as a result, they continue to burn their paper garbage in their backyard the way they always have because they don't have that option. Um, so don't be too hard on yourself because if you're too hard on yourself, you'll eventually develop an AB split, which, you know, be aware of. Anything to add to this or anything to whatever here? Term's almost over, guys. We are we are so close, so close. <coughs> that split can be wildly uncomfortable psychologically. Um, it, it results in what psychologists call cognitive dissonance, which is the discomfort people feel when they can't act in the way that they want to act. And cognitive dissonance is often subconscious. You're usually not aware of your cognitive dissonance. It's just kind of something that rides in the back of your self-conscious and will just make you grumpy until you real find a way to get rid of it. I actually recently um, kind of had a major personal psychological breakthrough and got rid of one of mine, and I'm actually much happier now. It's weird. Our human brains are very strange. Um, the subconscious mind is irrational. And 
we then ask, well, how else am I going to get to work other than my polluting car? I, for my career, have to fly across the country to go to that conference. I have to. Um, my dog deserves this, right? The dog doesn't care. The dog would be just as happy with a, a rock. They're dogs. They're beautiful creatures, but they are dogs. Um, my children deserve to go to Disney World. I did this in the spring. I took my kids to Disney World in the spring. It was delightful. It was also very carbon heavy. I admit to that. Um, but it's Christmas. We're coming up on But It's Christmas, guys. Oh boy, we're coming up on But It's Christmas. And Jesus, find a way to minimize that wrapping. I actually um, think about other things. I uh, have some friends across the country. I'm not sending them a package. I've got some really cool stickers. I put them in an envelope and I sent it to them. And I know that those people in particular will appreciate those decals because, well, they're also, they're, they're environmental people like me. So I know they like that. Oh, come on, but that, that dog clearly loves that little house, doesn't it? <laughs> The AB split is often magnified by privilege. Uh, the privileged elite are often much slower to change. Thus, that white male effect, uh, and especially rich white male effect that we talked about in our previous lecture, um, for sure, right? If you're able to continue in the way that you want to continue for forever, then you pr clearly probably won't change. So let's look at kind of maybe some of our options of where we could go. Regardless of what we personally do on the micro level, change is going to happen whether we like it or not. This final portion of the presentation is going to examine how society could change on the macro level and how that may work on the individual and micro level. And I, with my ADHD brain, lost my phone. There it is. Okay. I'm going to just jump to a few of these because this is kind of review, but there is content that is on the exam here. Uh, there are government solutions. A uh, one government solution is a so-called green tax or Pyrovingian tax. These are taxes that are created with the intention of reflecting the true environmental costs and shift the burden of government revenue generation away from taxes such as sales tax and value added tax. Uh, so these are taxes that are put into place to represent the damage that that thing is doing on the environment. This is something that traditionally the United States has been incredibly hesitant to do. It's honestly part of our cultural makeup to hate taxes, right? It's even in the narrative of why we broke away from Great Britain. Um, but it might be an option. Is it an option for, I, I honestly, sincerely don't know. We pay dramatically less for gas than most other countries. And part of that is because we don't have a Paravigian tax on our actual uh, gas consumption. Uh, as I mentioned, it is extremely unpopular. However, it is also important to know what you have present in, our, in your society. Our society, we hate taxes, but many people in our society also hate giving anything to anyone, right? Uh, especially poor people, right? But our tax structure, those elements in our government that do give money to poor people get, are webbed up into our tax, tax structure in a very clever way, actually. So, we just say, okay, poor people, you're gonna, you're gonna pay less in taxes now. And because those elements don't like taxes, it, it works politically. Does that make sense, what I just said? Basically, and I'm gonna be very clear about it, it's a way of tricking Republicans into giving poor people things. It's really what it comes down to, is uh, what it does is it, it, it lowers taxes in a certain way. Um, and it's, it's, it's intriguing um, and it's, it's weird. It's, it, our, our tax structure is incredibly weird. 
uh, largely because it is used as a mechanism to distribute wealth, which is not what it's intended to do. Um, it's, it's, it's uniquely Americanly idiosyncratic. Uh, but uh, tax credits surrounding solar panels are another way uh, that this operates. I don't know how much you look at home improvement things relating to solar panels, but if you sign up for one of them, you're, you'll get a notice like every couple months. Hey, we're gonna we're only going to be giving this tax break before it's going to expire in 2022. It's always before it's going to expire in about six months from right now. Right, it, it's almost always. I don't think these things are going to go away. They might, but there are kind of continuing efforts to get those uh, solar panel uh, tax credits in. Uh, if you know anything about, uh, well, this this is probably in your five year, ten year future, maybe. Um, solar panels are pretty darn expensive. They do pay for themselves, but they take about fifteen years to pay for themselves. So if you know you're going to be in the house for a long term, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of net neutral investment uh, financially, but of course, then it helps everyone too. Personally, I really sincerely think more solar panels would go up if it were legal to just be able to flip a switch and have that power go into your house. I sincerely think that's a major oversight, namely because it would be an emergency preparedness thing too. I, it's just, it's a colossal oversight. Uh, I'm jumping over this. We don't need this. Cap, we, capitalism is not great. That's a, buh, buh, buh. Externalities. There is a, a major problem in the way corporations operate. Corporations want to make money. We know this. They are not our friends. They're not inherently our enemies. They don't necessarily want us to die, but they don't care about us. And what corporations, this element of corporations operating that we could actually use against them that usually hurts us is the idea of the externality. An externality is uh, an unintended product or effect of doing business. And small business have externalities too, but corporations are designed to flow and get rid of externalities. Most pollution is externality, right? They don't mean it to happen. They're not trying to pump carbon into the atmosphere, but they do. That's an externality. And usually when we talk about this, if you would look it up in a dictionary or whatever, the default is negative externality which means uh, something that is damaging to the environment. However, environmentalist capitalists, which I will say, okay, I'm listening, right? Contend that if negative externalities can be minimized and positive externalities can be boosted, then capitalism might be able to become sustainable. And I am very clear, I am not a capitalist kind of person, but we have to listen to these ideas. We have to listen to all the ideas that might potentially help the environment because we don't know where, where the good stuff might come from. So for example, increased commuter bike sales could decrease traffic and pollution. That is a positive externality of selling bikes is that it could reduce pollution. Uh, this idea has been tied to another idea called smart growth, which is when urban development both benefits from and encourages positive ecological externalities. Really, what it is, is planning for another element in building a building or whatever. We just have to think about it. And quite frankly, for our whole history up to this point, we usually haven't thought about it. This is, <clears throat> the Netherlands is interesting for so many reasons. Honestly, drugs are one of the least interesting things about the Netherlands. Um, traditional Dutch urban architecture features narrow houses that are near the water, namely because most of the Netherlands is right on the water and there's not very much space at all. 
Narrow houses help make distributing resources more efficient. You don't have to drive 15 miles to the market because the market's right over there because there's no space, right? Heat goes up. You can get a water tower, put it way up in the air, and it distributes with a relatively high water pressure with everything being nice and tight, as opposed to in central Ohio, where we're all spread out super flat and all spread out, right? It's much more environmentally friendly. Additionally, it optimizes uh, being able to be a pedestrian, being able to be on bikes. Uh, Denmark, similarly, has urban in infrastructure that makes biking just like a no-brainer. It is absolutely urban, uh, normal environmentalism. You're an idiot in Copenhagen if you have a car. It makes no sense for you whatsoever, um, which is intriguing. Additionally, proximity to bodies of water encourages people to keep the water clean because if the water, you don't want your neighborhood to smell like shit, right? So everyone keeps their, it, it, they're invested in the neighborhood. We've talked a bit about lead certification. I'm just trying to stay on time. Dematerialization. This is a intriguing positive externality that has been absolutely on accident. If you look at how our economy has shifted due to the internet, we have eliminated so much material goods. When was the last time you, have you ever bought a CD? But only a couple. No, oh, okay, some of you have bought four CDs. Not as many as I did when I was a teen, okay? We used to have these huge racks and these, everyone had these file folders and there were record stores and see, I mean, they're cool. Record stores are great, but so much space has been eliminated and crunched, right? And, and that's great. Um, we've eliminated all that. CDs used to have this horrible shrink wrap over them that was impossible to get open. And then you would just psh, pull that open, throw it in a landfill, and it was gone. Uh, and then the, the CD case would probably break in a couple months anyway because your brother sat on it or something. Um, so MP3s, PDF books, other intellectual property, uh, these are things that we can actually use and sell to make profit if we need to make a living. My brother is kind of trying to pioneer um, these uh, templates. He's a lawyer. I said this. Uh, these uh, legal templates, and they try to sell off his website uh, for people that need just like a little bit of legal help, right? Uh, so he's set, sending them a PDF. They pay 20 bucks for the PDF. They send it. And then he can make his living through non-material means, right? That is, that is an interesting way to do it. If we take advantage of the non-material elements of the internet in all sorts of ways, then uh, we may uh, be able to um, help our environmentalist economy. Uh, there is a slight problem to truly work though, the devices that non-material products need need to be uh, sustainable and minimally damaging. You do need to buy a Kindle made of plastic to be able to read eBooks, right? The solution to that might be e-readers that last a really long time. Um, my current Kindle has lasted me at least five years though, so that's pretty good. And somebody who is a little less ADHD probably would last them longer, but I lose things, right? So for what that's worth. Uh, green labeling. Um, this is a point of controversy. Uh, some think that if companies take the effort to be more ethically sustainable, they should label their products. A lot of this, it can categorize as greenwashing um, with people trying to make money off the green certified whatever. Some of these are very uh, worthwhile and valuable. Some of them are kind of junk in terms of uh, being able to actually help the planet. Um, mm -mm -mm. Not on the test. I'm just trying to, okay, the 80% solution. <clears throat> really at this point, I'm doing triage and giving you the vocab you need. 
Um, the 80% pollution is the premise that most Americans work too much, but some people don't work enough. But what if we re redistribute that work? What if we reduce the amount of time people work by 20%? and thus require employers to hire 20% more employees, right? Which prior to our current situation with not enough employees made perfect sense, right? We are in a situation right now where we don't have enough people working and quite frankly, social scientifically, I don't have a good answer to that. I have a couple hypotheses, but I don't have a good answer to that. It may be that we are culturally kind of starting to shift to an 80% solution, right? Well, maybe it is that people are recognizing they only do wanna work four days a week, right? And they're kind of naturally doing that by be I'm an Uber driver for four days a week, I'm not getting any additional jobs or I'm cobbling together a bunch of a little short term work. That's a possibility. How does this pay for itself though, if we don't, if we still pay people a living wage, but only have people work 80% as what they used to? Well, we take that money from the CEOs of the major, the, the big CEOs that make 400 times as much as us. And we give that money to everyone else. So it would be a little controversial. Any questions or comments there? An interesting idea. This is not a new idea. This is not a new idea. Uh, there were people in the 1920s, the 1920s saying, we as a society technologically have the capacity to work four days a week, not just four days a week, four hours a day. We have that capacity if we just would be willing to have less stuff. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting concept. And this is coming from somebody who has three full-time jobs, not three part-time jobs, but whatever. I don't think about how many hours I work a week. <laughs> so a hypothesis I have is that if we, it could be that the current employment shortage is a unregulated version of this. It could be that we're just kind of, it's happening and we're not like making sure it's happening. So if we regulate it and recognize it, that people want to work less, maybe we would have enough workers right now, right? If we just put the workers where they need to be. Thus, it would create what's called plenitude, satisfaction with the abundance, instead of always seeking more, we would absolutely, to shift over to an, any kind of 80% pollution solution, have to be less satisfied, have to want less, right? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe get half as many Christmas presents, right? Maybe get a new car half as often, right? Um, if, and I, I think I may have alluded to this. This has been quite a year for me uh, in terms of like family history. I uh, spent a good portion of this year reading through my grandmother's diaries and they just had a different life. They, 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 they made a big deal out of going into town and getting some chocolate and cigars. Like it just wasn't, it just wasn't an everyday thing, right? And maybe if we just shift to be a little more materialist, less materialistic and a little bit more simple, that could be a possibility. It takes so much work. Let me see one thing. Uh, let's see here. It yeah, this, this damn thing, right? I, I, I would have had to, uh, I didn't need to buy a charger on the way down here with the effort of failing at uh, getting my computer to charge. This was a complete waste of time, right? But energy went into this. Maybe I shouldn't be able to do that, right? And maybe they shouldn't have torn down Bernie's and built a target on top of it so that I was tempted to do it. Anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, also though, it might not be a choice. <laughs> Things might fall apart. Uh, maybe our, we, we, it might be right now, we are having an 80% solution kind of inflicted on us by the forces of economics and things are going to shift whether we like it or not. It, 
in the event of and this is really talking about a little bit into the apocalypse shit uh which i actually did talk about uh, uh, my uh gsa uh thing that i talked about the other night um we will continue we humans will continue even if our governments fall apart there are so many of us numerically that humanity will continue so if that's a bummer to you we, we can't die out um what was it like 70 million people died during world war ii and that is 0.5 percent of the total world population right you can't kill all the humans it's an impossibility uh we figure out ways to trade things uh if you this is a map of the silk road through um asia and it is thousands upon thousands of miles of trade routes uh, from the pre-modern era. Uh, here uh, on the right is a map of the Hopewell trade routes, as in the Hopewell civilization that existed here for thousands of years before white people ever got here. Um, the Hopewell civilization lived not necessarily a modern life, but a pretty sophisticated life uh, compared to um, actually civilizations that came after them. I'm just going to hit the major terms now. The, 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 the presentation has broken down to me just giving you what you need to know. Uh, concept of environmental flows. If we do something in one place, it's probably also impacting something in another place. And this is especially true in the global economy. Uh, we, if we need boxes one place, we need to cut down trees in another place. If we need plastic in one place, we need to get oil from another place. If we use plastic in one place, that plastic is going to get dumped in another place. That's the idea of an environmental flow. Transition town. This is a meso level application of multiple sustainability ideas. The idea here being that the entire town, the entire area, maybe the entire neighborhood is one social ecosystem, thus making the entire community sustainable. And this can make sustainability efforts go from micro to mezzo. This is kind of what I was having you do in the paper when I said, okay, get bigger, okay, get bigger. It's, it's this kind of looking at it in the bigger aspects in that way. Did I talk about time-based currency? I think I talked about that last time, didn't I? No, this is different. Okay, that, that was the my uh, sociology of poverty class. Um, time-based currency, uh, I mean, mm -hmm, yes. So you can use currency only in one given location right? We don't have to use dollars, right? It's again, it's a social construct. Um, it is, and people sometimes don't quite understand that. Uh, there is a common misconception that it is illegal to buy or sell anything in the United States uh, not using American dollars. The illegal part is to take American dollars and use them and turn them into another currency. For some reason, my father was obsessed with this uh, when, when I was younger. I don't know why. Local, the concept of a local currency is to like create OSU bucks. I mean, Disney World's been doing this for decades, right? Um, and in creating these local currencies that can only be used locally, you keep the goods local, right? So if you want to create a buy local uh, component there, then you get a whole bunch of people to buy into the idea. Now, of course, it's only as valuable as people buy into it, but if people buy into it, it becomes, uh, it becomes local. Uh, here we have examples of a, a local currency called the Bristol Pound in the UK. The, another alternative to that is what's called a time bank. This is another local currency. This is the Ithaca Hour. Uh, the Ithaca Hour is a volunteer-based local currency. So, this one isn't based as much on material things as it is based on, I need my fence painted, or I need someone to 
chop, help me chop down a tree, or I need someone to uh, reprogram my computer or whatever. So I know that cost that uh, makes an IT person takes them a half an hour of their effort to do to fix my computer that I can't do. So I will give them half an hour of currency. And then that half hour of currency they can take and then uh, have someone uh, rake their lawn for half an hour. And then that person that's given that half, half hour of currency can go buy a cup of coffee with it, right? It's, it's like money. It, this, the time-based currency one is based on volunteerism and thus community, which is kind of cool. Um, and it also keeps products local. Uh, the Ithaca Hour is the best established one in Ithaca, New York. The Madison Hour also exists. You will note Ithaca and Madison are both hippy dippy college towns, obviously. Um, that's, that's kind of the natural environment of those things. Questions there? It's a really very interesting idea. Yeah. I guess like if that was used on more of like a societal level, how would that work? Because, you know, the person fixing your computer is like a skilled laborer. Right. And so how can they say that like their work is equivalent in value to someone raking right. your lawn? That is the overriding assumption that all workers labor is of equal value. Okay. It's a very communist idea. Yeah, right? because then it, like, it, yes. people wouldn't be motivated to go to college or to like get a certain level of education if it's not gonna. Like, right, it, it, it eschews that idea. It, it, it automatically says no, right? Uh, on a huge level, it would have to assume that college would be free, right? We would have to do fundamental to, to work on the macro level, you would need that. On a community level, it could work. And especially as a secondary currency, right? It, it, in, yeah, I mean, I'm gonna have to pay my taxes with bucks. I'm gonna have to get a computer at Best Buy with whatever dollars. But like on a community building level, that's what it is. And that's what it, the Ithaca Hour and the Madison Hour do is they, they build community. You could go to a farmer's market with this shit. I mean, for what that's worth. I think someone made a comment in the chat. Oh, they did, okay. Um, there is no code word for today, Jenny. Sorry about that. I thought it was relevant to this. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, activism is always important. I'm not going to talk about that more. Any more vocab? Hidden arts of resistance. I'm really going into the full blown. Okay, two more terms. Hidden arts of resistance. In an oppressive society, in a society where environmentalism is not normal, we who do not agree resist, right? And different, just like activism looks different in different societies, hidden arts of resistance are different in different societies. Uh, this is a study by James Scott, who's a political scientist. So in a heavily repressive society where the individual is not able to express themselves legally, that's where you're more likely to see political graffiti. That's where you see people protesting with masks on. That is not a commentary on the fucking Proud Boys this weekend, by the way. Uh, that is um, hacking, actually, is a hidden art of resistance as well. And uh, passing messages out of view of authority figures. So that is largely the political component there, but we also have our hidden arts of resistance, right? If we can't get a composting program off the ground in uh, our community, we will compost locally, right? If we can't get um, rid of all microplastics, we at least won't have them in our house. And those hidden arts of resistance also do contribute to the eventual rise of uh, normal environmentalism. And then finally, relative deprivation theory. This is an idea that we must, um, we must, climate anxiety is okay. It, 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 it serves a purpose, it functions. To do anything, most human beings have to feel in danger, 
or oppressed in some way. We have to feel relatively deprived, right? In order to actually do something. So the fact that climate anxiety is rising is actually a positive thing. We just can't let us let it overwhelm us, right? And the tip I actually gave to the USG uh, on Sunday night was, if you like sci-fi, there is positive sci-fi. Solar punk is a very real genre of sci-fi literature that is really pretty cool. Um, seek out those things and read those things that actually have a positive perspective and they're not about robots just coming in and murdering everyone, right? Uh, there's a really cool book I love. It's a little dated, but pretty cool called The Fifth Sacred Thing. And that is a near future sci-fi thing. I think it takes place in like the year 2015 or something, but it, it's old, but it, it's a pretty cool book about like uh, the American government has collapsed, but there is a new government, I think surrounding city state in San Francisco. And it's just, it, it's a pretty cool book. It's called The Fifth Sacred Thing by a lady that calls herself Starhawk. Um, okay, it's 12 of five. I eat into five minutes of study time. Get your study guides out and I am, we are going to list things on the board and then talk about them. And I am going to pull up the exam if I have to access it. Uh, those of you who are online, um, yeah. Um, oh, yours is dead. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. <clears throat> oh, no, no. Okay, we're good. Oh, no. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to, I'll just stop my screen share. Is that a little bit? Uh, those of you who are online, I will open the chat and so that you can ask questions. Um, but in the meantime, I will just look at these. So uh, while you're looking over your stuff, I will tell you a little bit about the exam. It is 40 multiple choice questions worth two points each with two more detailed questions at the end worth, a, worth 10 points each for a total of 100 points for the exam. Mm-hmm. That's slightly off, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Okay. What on the study guide do you want me to go over? Yeah, um, all the bigger questions. The bigger questions, okay. Yeah. That means I have to pull it up. Is that listed on the home page? There we are. Okay, so. Uh, Noted. Okay, anything else? Yeah. Uh, no most in physics. Okay. Okay, anything else? Yeah. A contagion theory. Contagion theory. Handwriting is about to get unreadable. Just playing. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Hmm? Uh, cultural diffusion and intentional social change. 
intentional social change. Anything else? Sorry, the chat got away from me online, guys. Ideological commitments. Uh, main man wants classic qualities of an SMO. And then, yeah, okay. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Progressive and regressive social movement. Okay. What else? Mm -hmm. Um. Do we need to know like more specific things about the Cuyahoga River, or just like, just let it lit on fire. on fire? Not exactly what chemical combination okay, caused it. Cool. It lit on fire. In that series, there were a number of river fires that happened in like a five year period, and that caused the Clean Water Act to happen. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the short of it. Yeah, um, which was horrendous. Um, okay, I'll start in on this. Uh, I'm also going to um, look at the exam to remind myself what's on because. I have a well-documented bad memory. Okay, so. That's what I thought. I will come back to nomos and thesis. Uh, basically, uh, these two are linked uh, as being, uh, I can't remember which is which at the moment, uh, the conversation that um, among the ancient Greeks, they uh, were the ones to um, start to make that distinction between the natural world and the social world. And I believe if I remember correctly, nomos is the social world, thesis is, I know that I'm saying that wrong because I'm not a Greek person, uh, is the physical world. And so that, that is kind of where we started to first talk about that. That's really the whole conversation there. I know that is present in, um, I think lecture, either lecture 8.1 or lecture 7.1. Uh, contagion theory, states contagion theory is a theory of it's basically a riot theory it explains why riots happen so when people are agitated when people are intoxicated when people are a little bit off kilter and they're in a group um there is a potential for the group to infect the individual and that's kind of what causes people to start throwing rocks or light couches on fire or tipping over cars. Um, that's contagion theory. It's not a very elegant theory, quite frankly. Uh, what's called emergent norm theory is a little bit better uh, at explaining that, but that's what you need to know about contagion theory. Um, mm -mm, mm -mm. Cultural diffusion is the movement of um cultural elements across society so you know the idea of chemical diffusion right so if you dump some salt in some water uh over time the water the salt will dissolve and it'll all become salt water right that's chemical diffusion similarly uh 
Mexican food uh, started in the Southwest, spread across the United States, and now there are Taco Bells in uh, Maine, which is kind of like Mexican food. Uh, thus, it, the, the cultural idea spread over the country. That makes sense? Yeah. Can you talk about emergent norm theory, like as it relates to- Sure, is that on the theory? list? Yeah. Great. Uh, emergent norm theory uh, is a little bit, like I said, a little bit more elegant. Um, it, emergent norm theory states that if we are standing around in a group at like a rally or a protest or whatever, and each of us individuals is kind of perpetually making decisions, what's this going to look like? What's this going to be, right? Is this, we are collectively deciding, is this going to be a violent protest? Is it going to be a peaceful protest? And often when riots spark, it is because everyone in that group is making a collective decision. So uh, let's say, for example, um, well, the example I often use is somebody in the crowd uh, just feels really passionate. They pick up a rock and they throw it at a group of cops, right, that are standing right by the protest. And in that moment, the collective group um, decides, how do we feel about this right here happening right now, right? Do we think, you know what? The cops have been treating us wrong for far too long. And everyone makes the decision, yeah, we're gonna throw rocks too, right? And with the people making those decisions, it then becomes a riot. And then also those people that go, no, 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 this is not for rock throwing. They leave, they self-select out, Thus, actually, by those people not throwing rocks leaving, they make the crowd actually more intense by self-selecting out that behavior. It could go the other way, or they could, the alternate version of that could be uh, everyone in the crowd going, no, 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 we're not rock throwers. Hey, cops, come get him right here. And then he comes in and they take him away, right? and the crowd remains peaceful. And then those people who would be willing to throw rocks, they go, what the hell with this? And then they leave, and then the crowd actually becomes more peaceful. Does that make sense? We are all collectively making, and that, that works in almost all um, social settings. Where it becomes an emergent norm is when things just kind of shift and happen all at once, right? It, it's it's um, very good for explaining how uh, a rally can spark into a riot. Um, what, what, what did I write here? Ideological what? Oh, okay, I see. Um, so what was happening here, there are three qualities to a social movement. And I listed three of those qualities on the study guide. A social, not a social movement though, but a social movement organization. Each social movement is made up of many social movement organizations, right? Uh, a social movement organization must have leadership, organization, and an ideological commitment to change. So uh, Martin Luther King was the leader of, I believe, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. That conference was loosely organized around church structures, right? Thus the organization. And uh, during uh, MLK's time, he wanted to reform laws surrounding Black people in the United States. So those three things making it a social movement organization. The civil rights movement was not a social movement organization. It was a social movement. It did not have overarching leadership. It did not have overarching organization. It was a, a mass of multiple organizations. Uh, in terms of micro to macro level, there tend to be mass movements made up of multiple little movements. Um, and then that's the SMO qualities. Uh, progressive movements tend to be those, the progressive movements are those that want to cause society to change in ways that they haven't been before. Regressive movements want to take society back to a way it used to be. If you are a, a politically savvy person, you may think, well, progressive movements are always liberal, regressive movements are always conservative. That is a tendency, not always true. Um, not always true, it's a tendency though. 
Sometimes it splits differently. Um, <coughs> let me look a little more carefully on this exam to figure out where that stupid Greek stuff is. Look, see if there's anything else you want to ask. Okay, so another thing you want to go over is you want to look at frame alignment theory. And you want to look at those categories of frame alignment theory. You also want to be very familiar <coughs> with Mary Douglas's um, axes of uh, the, um, the individualist, the communitarian, the hierarchical, the egalitarian. Remember, hierarchical and uh, egalitarian are on one axis, and then individualist and communitarian are on one axis, and then of the combinations of those, which is the individual that is most likely to resist efforts to stop climate change? You, that, I'm not, what is it? You know, remember? Yes. That's right. Yes. The hierarchical individualist is the one most likely to resist climate change. And uh, that syncs up with, and that explains what makes Americans different, right? Because we are a highly individualistic society. And uh, that is what, what the deal is with uh, very traditionally conservative people in the United States is that they are individualists and they also believe in hierarchy or as uh, people would say, I believe that if you deserve something, you should get it, right? That's another way of stating that. That also then though, I don't want you to walk away from this class thinking that all hierarchical individualists are anti-environmentalists, right? It's just a tendency uh, about 40% of hierarchical individualists absolutely agree with probably most of what we're saying in this class, right? It's not everyone, it's, it's a tendency, yes. Um, so you said hierarchical individuals are most likely to resist climate change. Are most likely to resist efforts. Okay. They think that they're most likely to think it's all made up, okay. right? It's a conspiracy. It, is it's nonsense, right? Those are the people unlikely to change so that, yes. Good, thank you, that's good. Anything else there? Yeah. Now the bigger questions. Yeah, 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 yes, thank you. Um, so, bigger questions. Uh, yeah, according to ancient Jewish practice, uh, the land was uh, permitted to rest uh, for one year every seven years and then every 49 years. I think I cut this out from previous versions of the exam. Uh, if, you, if you've ever heard of this thing called the Jubilee year in the ancient Jewish calendar, um, that's what we're talking about there. Really, I was getting at the point of some traditional cultures uh, actually let the land rest for a while at some point. Um, after the conversion of Europe from paganism to Christianity, what happened to the old pagan practices? Uh, those things were folded into folk culture, basically. They were not being openly celebrated as the religious holidays, but they became kind of what, what we do locally here, right? It's as if a calm fest locally started off as a religious celebration, right? Uh, that kind of thing. It's much easier to get people to convert to a religion, actually, than to get them to stop celebrating their holidays, which is intriguing too. Uh, be able to describe Douglas's axes, just talked about that. How would you describe the environmental concern in the United States since the mid 20th century, specifically since the mid 70s? Anyone want to take a stab at that? It's been consistently high. 
right? It's been in the top five the whole time since the mid 1970s. It hasn't gone away like some other things. Um, Americans are more religious compared to other people in the global north. <coughs> what is the political advantage of uh, converted to Christianity during ancient Rome? Uh, they took advantage of that dualism component there. What do we know? Why do we know more about European cultures than those from other parts of the world? Namely, because we destroyed those cultures in other parts of the world and Europeans maintained their own cultures, an element of uh, colonialism. Um, I want you to understand uh, frame transformation. And then, frame transformation and frame amplification, right? When we're talking about Benford's, Benford and Snow's frame alignment theory about how social movements adapt and get people to join by changing their worldviews effectively. There are four, four types of those four types, I'm gonna talk about two right now. Frame amplification is about revving it up, right? We see in Ukraine right now, the revving up that Ukrainian identity of being survivors. That is a very old element of Ukrainian national identity. And that is being used by the Ukrainian resistance to really drive their military force now. That is a uh, frame amplification is what that is. And then frame transformation is about changing a frame from one thing to something wildly different. Frame transformation is rare. It doesn't happen often because it is kind of very wild. It would be something along the lines of converting someone from being a business person to a, a drug dealer, right? Like just something like just wildly different or like a member of the Navy to a Scientologist, right? Well, they both have boats. If you know anything about Scientology, there's a lot of boat lore in Scientology, which is strange. Um, that, that would be, and if you would, so if you, a Scientologist would specifically be trying to recruit Navy recruits, that would be frame transformation, just like a big jump. Um, and then there's also frame bridging and then frame uh, the other one, but those aren't as important. Whenever I list four things, I can never list the fourth one. Um, do we understand Douglas's four elements there? Because that's super important. That's an essay. Um, anything else? Yes. How many multiple choice and extended options are there? 40 multiple choice. Two fill in the blank. One, one thing about those in a second. And then one essay. When you take the fill in the blank, if you spell it slightly wrong, or if you capitalize it differently than I capitalized it, it'll mark it wrong. I'm gonna grade those all manually anyway. Don't worry about it, okay? That, that throws people off and they get upset about it. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna look at it with my human eyes because I have to grade the essays anyway. Anything else? Good job. It's been quite a semester, hasn't it? Ah. Um, yeah, I think we're done. Are you done? I'm done. Great. Good class. I don't hate any of you. <laughs> <laughs>
And I don't say that when I don't read it. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Do we have anything going on Thursday?